Hey guys, my name is Kendrick and welcome to ENFP Mail. Today I get a chance to interview Dr. Mike um, Budria. How do you pronounce your last name? Budria. Budria. Yeah. From, from NF Geeks. So a Man. lot of you um, were requesting for me to have him on this channel and he is one of the ENFP males out there that started with the social media, with YouTube and whatnot. And, and so uh, Dr. Mike, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, especially for a lot of us who has never been exposed to any of your materials. Sure. Uh, uh, first, uh, uh, Kendrick, I want to thank you and I, uh, very much for inviting me and reaching out to me to do this. I've been wanting to get back into my uh, YouTube channel this year, and I've sort of been on and off on it, and this sort of was a nice way to get back on the saddle. So I'm very appreciative of, uh, of your invite. So thank you very much, uh, first of all. Um, all right. Well, uh, I'm an ENFP. That's that's the obvious one. Um, I'm um, I'm a Generation X. I'm I'm 49. I'm going to be 50 this summer. I, I can't believe an ENFP can be 50, but it's true. <laughs> I'm, go I'm going to be 50 years old. Just on the outside, I guess. Yeah, yeah. No kidding. All right. That's that's the the problem with being an ENFP is that you're a boy on the inside, <laughs> a, bo a boy in a man's body. That's, yeah, exactly. That's, yeah. Um, I um. I, I spent most of the past uh, 20 years working in higher ed, uh, I don't, in higher education. I don't work in higher education anymore, but I used to. Uh, I have a PhD. I have a PhD in humanities. I have a master's of arts in humanities, and I have a master's of arts in holistic leadership. And first of all, yes, there is such a thing as a master's of arts in holistic leadership. And uh, it's all very NF. I'm very well educated um, in NFness. Uh, I uh, I still love typology. I know I've been I've been sort of underground with typology for a few years, but I still love it just as much as I always have. I I talk about it every single day of my life. There isn't a day that goes by where I'm not talking about someone's type, someone's yeah. temperament. It's uh, I love it just as much as I always have, uh, very much so. And um, and so I guess what makes me special is that I'm an ENFP, you know, past middle age going into the last. <laughs> you know, going into the the last sunset, sort of. I mean, not really. I mean, I'm not, but I'm on the I'm on the second half of my life. I think that's right. what makes, uh, it makes this interesting. So, so go ahead, ask ask your questions. I'm ready. Oh well, I'm curious now. Why did you stop making videos for NF Geeks when it was building momentum and people really? Ah, okay, sure. Uh, I didn't really mean to stop. Stop. And I, I never really stopped. I check the channel every day. I always see if there's comments or whatever. I decided that I wanted to go um, in a different direction with typology. So instead of having this big, huge following, uh, what I actually have been doing for the past five years in typology is I've been running a very, very small, tight-knit group of NFs. Um, that's just a, a community of NFs. You can't find it. It's a secret Facebook group. Okay. Uh, it's, you know, so it's uh, it's it's invite only of NFs, and it's called Crystal Star Castle. That's the name of the of the group, and it's so I've really been running sort of this experiment in NFness to create a tight knit family of NFs through um, through social media, and to create an online community of people and relationships, and it's been a a remarkable experience. And so I've really been with all my energy actually has been focused in that. And right now, the, that form, Crystal Star Castle, is sort of in a, it's going into hibernation a little bit. It's not done. I mean, there's still people in it and, and people are posting and talking. But um, I'm looking to sort of either add some new vigor to it or maybe change the format of it completely. I don't know. Uh, so this is also, again, a good segue into that. So for the past few years, I, I've been involved in typology. I've just been involved, instead of having this huge forum and this channel, I've just been sort of made my focus on this very tiny community of roughly about 150 people. That's pretty uh, big. More or less, and just try to create um, a a little a little NF village. That's that's sort of what I was trying to do, and <laughs> had many adventures with it. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> yes. So that's where I've been. I haven't like disappeared. I didn't. I didn't get sick or anything like that. I always meant to come back, and I am going to come back. I'm, I mean, this is again a motivation uh, to do that. But I just decided that I wanted to put my instead of put my focus into something smaller and more intense and more deeper, uh, and, and try to build that. Now, when you come back, are you going to be doing the same format as what you were doing before, or are you going to do it completely different this time? Um, I don't think I'm going to do as many interviews. I, I might do interviews. Uh, what I'd really like to do in my dream of dreams <laughs> is to really build up the channel, get some better equipment, get some, get some funding going, get some money. And if I interview people, I'd like to travel to where they are and interview them in person. 
So like in my in my NF fantasy is I was instead of doing this like we're doing it, I would go to wherever get on a plane, go to wherever you are and film you, you know, together we'd be in the same room. That would be my dream is to kind of go around the country or even go around the world and interview other NFs. I don't know if that's going to happen. <laughs> But um, for but for the first part, I'm probably just going. I have a lot of ideas that I've built up since the last videos, and I need to kind of get them out. So a lot of it is going to be. I think the first ones are going to be me monologuing more than anything else, and then eventually interviews. But I don't think I'm going to do it the way I did it before. Gotcha. All right. So I'm going to go to some of the questions that people ask. So, Great. I can't uh, wait. This is the biggest one. Hands okay. up, the biggest one. Do you know who Dave Superpowers is? Um, I, I, yeah, of course, everybody knows who Dave Superpowers is. Are you, are you aware how, how of could you, how could you, how could you not know who Dave Superpowers is? You're right. He has the old, he used to do the videos with the ovals. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Says, yeah, Of course. And, everybody uh, knows Dave Superpowers. Are you aware of his new system, Objective Personality? Uh, yes, people have been um, making it aware of to, to me, have brought it uh, to my attention. Um, people have always brought Dave Super, even like five years ago. Six years ago, people brought Dave Power Superpowers to my attention. People are always bring him to my attention, even now. Right. So, yeah, it's on my it's on my radar. People have been um, uh, saying, "What do you think of this? Do you think of that video? You know, whatever." And the and the whole typing thing that's going on and the classes and all that. Yeah, so I'm I'm aware of it. Have you gotten a chance to look at it, or do you know? Are do you know what's happening in there? Like, well, I'm not a I'm not a part of it, so I mean, I only know I only know secondhand things. So I know what people show me. So I know what people say, Mike, did you seen this video? Have you heard about this? Have you heard about that? So I, I don't have any direct experience of it as much as I have um, other people's interpretation of it. Gotcha. If that makes sense. It, it does. Um, now, when you, when you follow MBTI, do you also follow it with, you know, the Dave superpowers, like the circle cloud thing with the cognitive function, you know, like you're an ENFP, right? So you have extrovert intuition first, sure. introvert feeling, extrovert thing. Yeah, to, to, uh, certainly, yes. I always take... I take the functions into account always and think about them and talk about them and, and uh, you know, look for them. And, you know, it's part of my, my dialogue too, uh, of course. Uh, my, own, my concern has always been that, that, and this isn't necessarily what Dave Superpower is doing. I'm really talking about the MBTI community in general. Right. But my main concern has always been that people attribute too many processes to one function. That really a person is a, you know, it's a system of things working together like a machine and that we're really much, you know, all the things happening at once that people sometimes describe too much to FI or too much to NE or too much to D or whatever, as if your whole consciousness is, can be wrapped up into this tiny ball called TE or, or TI or whatever. Right. Um, and that's my main concern is like, no, you're really, you know, your, your, your personality and the way you're processing all this is the whole combination. It's all four letters. Uh, going on. So you have to take into account extroversion. You have to take into account how, you know, how, what NFness is in terms of the temperament and, and, you know, put it all together at once. But I, but certainly do I, you know, do I use that language and do I talk about the function? Yeah, of course. How can you not? Yeah, uh, of course. <laughs> my apology, yeah. So um, as an ENFP, um, you know, the fourth function that we have is introvert sensing, which is supposed to be the weakest one. Oh, yes. Do, do you ever indulge in practicing to improve that or do you ignore that completely and just work ah. on stronger ones? Okay. Well, this is great. So this is the, the world according to Dr. Mike. So, so yeah. first of all, I don't believe that you can actually work on any of these things. I don't believe that you could, you could be aware of it and you could sort of incorporate it and know that it's tripping you up, but I don't believe that you can actually make it better or worse in the same sense that you can't make yourself taller. You know, you, there's certain things that are sort of, you're sort of locked into. So I'm always going to have a very weak um, introverted ses sensing. The best I can do is sort of, in retrospect, know when it tripped me up. I, it's, I don't even know if, I, if it's possible because it's so unconscious that you can know in the moment that it's tripping you up. But certainly I can look back and know that it's tripping me up. So for example, so, so I think this is a common ENFP problem, but you know, what my introverted sensing does is that it's, it makes me a hypochondriac. You know, I can't, uh, I, you know, I can't identify anything in my body and anything I have is immediately, you know, I'm dying. You know, it's something terrible. I can't, I can't regulate my own. And it's really bad, you know, approaching 50 because you start thinking every little pain is a heart attack. You know, I'm, I, I've, I have a pain in my toe. That's obviously a sign of a, of a micro fracture in my heart. Right. Uh, you start going there. So I could be aware of, so I, I could be aware of, I could say, okay, 
I'm not really having a heart attack. I'm really, that's just my SI not able to remember or, or, you know, interpret what's going on within my own body. But I, and, and, and I fall. And so I have to remember that I occasionally fall into a hypochondria, but I don't know that you can actually make it better. Like, I don't know if I can improve my SI. I, I could be aware of it and I could sort of forgive myself for it. That's, that's what I think I can do. I don't know that I can make it better. And uh, I, 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 so whatever you just said right now created a two part question for me. So I'm going to go sure. ask the question. Oh, please. Uh, first one is why do you think it's fixed? Like you can't improve upon your weaker functions. Okay. T- uh, there's two reasons for that. One is that there's no actual method of doing this or measuring it. One of the things I think we have to do in typology is we really need to clean up our research game because it's terrible. I can tell you, somebody has a PhD, it's terrible. And we need to make that better. So there's no actual method and measurement as opposed to let's say like weightlifting. Okay, I can present to you a method of how to make your, you know, your biceps bigger and you could then do that method and then we can measure it. We could take a tape measure and measure. You could have this many inches, that many inches, and you can see the growth through measurements. There's nothing like that exists. You can't give me a method to improve my, my SI and the, oh, not just you, I mean, but anybody. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, I can't, there's no method that can improve my SI and then take out my SI meter and measure it. Mm, oh, look, it's, it's three degrees bigger now, your SI. This, you know, none of that, none of that exists. So when we're saying I'm improving and I'm not improving it by, by what means of method and measurement is that going on? That, that, none, of that, none of that actually exists as a model. So that's the first thing. The second reason is that I feel that all the functions, the whole thing, the whole typology thing is really telling you the way your, your mind is structured for information processing. It's telling you what parts exist and how they go together. And it's not telling you anything more than that. They're not, you're not dealing with muscles. You're not dealing with things that can, that can grow or change. It's just telling you the structure in the same sense that, you know, biology could say you have bones, you have a heart, you have a a limbic system, but it can't tell you exactly what you can do with that limbic system to make it more limbic. If that's even a thing, it could just, it's just telling you, this is what the structure is. So I, I think that, that those two things together is where my reasoning is based on it. And also to, so now I'm giving you a third thing. Now I'm rambling. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> All right. But the third part of it would be, part of it is also age. You, when you get older and you get old, and someday you'll be old too. <laughs> yeah. when, you get, when you get old, you start realizing that there are absolute limitations, that there really are absolute limitations, that you can't just be anything, grow anything, do anything, go. You don't have an equal chance in going in all directions. There's absolutely limitations in time. There's limitations in health. Uh, there's, there's limitations in terms of even mental capacity, mental ability. Uh, there's, there's definite, um, there's definite boundaries and understanding the boundaries is sort of, this is very Taoist, but understanding the boundaries is the way to have freedom. <laughs> so if you know that, okay, there's certain things I can't do or won't do or never going to get beyond, then, then what can I do? And then you can work with that and then you can move forward. Okay. That's my, that's, that's my rambling. All right. So all, all the stuff that you said, you know, I produced three new questions for me. So I oh sure, great. I guess I'm, I'm you know, coming. I have I'm, I have NEs, obviously. You know, I'm gonna sure, yeah. questions. Um, so the first thing is that um, in the Dave Superpower system, he mm-hmm. said that he took some time off because he's he, uh, Dave Superpower is an INTJ. Yes, and that he, I knew. He said that he robbed um, time that he was using his NI and gave it to his SE. Uh, okay. Because uh, in, in his system, he said that people are having tidal waves as a result of not using their fourth function. And what's happening is that people are messing up their life. So, for example, with ENFPs, ENFPs tend to have problems with discipline as a result. Oh, of, yeah, sure. Um, having that's, problems. And I would say that's true. We, we have terrible problems with discipline. And he yeah, said I agree. Direct, and he said that's a direct result of a weak SI. Like, you don't want to lock yourself down in one place. You are obsessed with freedom instead of uh, con- and instead of controlling yourself you want freedom and when someone tries to tell you what to do or try to control you you freak out and he said that those are irrational fears that every type has uh, everyone's a little bit different he said as an INTJ his irrational fear is chaos while ENFP can live in chaos and we're okay with it but when someone tries to tell us what to do or try to control us that's when we freak out so he said that every type um, has a coin has a balance so like people who has a, who are EPs desire freedom 
and hate control. People with IJ, so I first letter J S last. Yep, yep. yep. They, I'm following they, you. They fear chaos and they desire control. Oh yes. People with IP, they they desire their identity and they fear the tribe. While EJs is the opposite, where they desire tribe validation, but they fear their identity. So they almost have identity crisis. So that's kind of like the system that he figured out, and he objectively typed it based on real data that he's measuring. Okay, I, I would, um, well, all right, so here's what I want to say to that. Um, I, I agree with all of that. I think all of that is true. I think for each, for each type, I would say that's true. I do think that could be extrapolated from MBTI as it exists. But I, but I would validate that all those ideas. I would say that's true about um, the EJs. I think that's very true about the EJs. That's why ESFJs are like obsessed with, um, with their social standing and how things look and how things appear and the appearances of things. That's why they're you know obsessed with that. My mother was an ESFJ, and she was one of those who would get dressed up to go to the emergency room. Right. You know, she wouldn't just go. She wouldn't just go to night ground. She's got to put on her nice coat and her nice hat yeah. and a brooch and a, you know, she's got to show up. It, it, it takes 20 minutes. Right. You know, you know, she's about to pass out. Uh, so I, but I agree. I, I agree that all those things are, are true about those types. And I agree that's true about ENFP. I would, what I would add to it or, or give my, you know, my angle is I would, I look at the, um, this is what I mean by the whole four letters. I look at, the ENFP chaos or not wanting to be tied down as a die down as a perceiver problem. That's why I bring in per, the perceiver attitude. Um, one thing about being in, about having a dominant NE and being a perceiver, I don't know if you have this experience, but I have this experience is that um, sometimes all things are equal. All truths are equal. All activities are equal. It's hard to make any kind of decisions because everything is sort of existing in this relative space horizontally in degrees, but not necessarily in any kind of top-down hierarchy. So everything seems equal. So it's almost like a, like a lazy Susan, you know, one of those things in the cupboard that you just spin around and there's spices and there's canned goods and it just goes round and round and round. Sometimes my mind uh, feels like that. So I, agree, so I completely agree. I think he's right about that. I just, I approach it from the perceiver attitude like that's a result of, of perceiverness so th this is going to be the the more tricky question i have for you then um, okay so in, in in his mindset you need to rob from your first function which is ne for us and give it to si in our case so for whichever type you are you're gonna let's say esfj you're robbing robbing it from your fe and giving it to your um ti now you said earlier that there's a limitation because we don't have that much time in our world so sure. do you think that we should be working in balancing ourselves by robbing from our first function and giving it to our fourth? Or do you think we should just indulge in our strong function and leave the other ah, to someone else? I, I, I have an answer for that that I've always had. That's a great question. I like that question. Okay, first, and this is what I mean by we have to get our research stuff tighter. By what method am I putting NE into my SI? And how am I measuring that to know that that's happening? Where's my NESI meter? There has to be a way of measuring it to show that there's change. Now, I'm not saying that can't happen, but it, for that to be a real thing, we need to develop a way of measuring those things. Now, somebody who does, who does research testing, you know, in psychology could do that. I'm not one of those, but, but we need that. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing, though, is I'm, I believe that we should go with our dominant functions. I'm a big believer in, in the other side of it, that we should go with, with the, that, you know, any is my strongest um, function and any steers me right. Any has always given me the right answer. Anytime I screwed up in life, and boy, I have a long list of this. Every time I've ever screwed up in life, it's because I didn't listen to my NE. My NE told me the answer, and then my FI got all anxiety, you know, or whatever, or low self esteem, or something happened. And and in the end, it was always my FI was wrong and my NE was right, and I should have listened to my NE. My NE was telling me truth and i ignored it it's never been my any was wrong it's that i didn't i the any was giving me the signal and i to chose to ignore it or it gave me you know anxiety and and i didn't want to deal with the situation that it was telling me or whatever but i think you should go with your dominant functions i think if you're dumb you can't lose with your dominant function it's not it's not perfect it's not going to give you a hundred percent of truth, <laughs> you know, it's not that strong, but it's never going to lead you wrong. It's always, you're, you're always going to sort of land in the right field with your dominant function. So I'm, I, I actually lean towards that. Um, do you think you should go hundred percent in dominant functions or do you think it should be an 80, 20 rule kind of, kind of deal? 
Well, I, I actually think that you need the whole system together, that you do need the whole system together. And you can't take it, you can't really separate these things out. I'm always going to have an FI response to my NE. And right. it's auxiliary, so it's not going to be that, that complex. It's either going to make me happy, sad, angry. You know, I can rattle off my feelings very easily. So right. as an FI, it's always going to give me an answer. So I always have to take that into account. I have to take into account my perceiverness and, and that, that it gives me the ability to adapt. But I really think if you want to compensate for your own functions, you need other people in your life who have different personality types to give you insight. Like you need an INFJ, <laughs> you know, as an ENFP to anchor you to the ground and to, to help you out. Or you need an SJ to tell you what the practical things are. I think that we find, we can find a filling for those deficits in relationships with other people and other types who are stronger in those areas. Because I don't think it can ever, I mean, there's, the, the, I, even if there was a real method to strengthen your SI, I don't know if, you, if it's ever going to be anything that's going to actually make me a better person. I think I'm a better person if I interact with other people who have different functions than me, different types, and I listen to the wisdom of that type. You know, as an ENFP, I, I don't know about you, but certainly, you know, nothing brings me down like SJs, you know, sometimes. But SJs have their own wisdom. SJs have their own, uh, you know, practical way of living in life and functioning that is that is helpful and to follow. And it's okay to ask an SJ for help. So I kind of I kind of go in that direction. Yeah, I, I, I completely uh, understood what you meant when you felt down. It was an SJ, some, some kind of SJ thing happening that, uh, that, that made you feel that way. Because uh, that, that's how I feel a lot of times. You know, um, let me ask you a question about uh, the functions. So sure. one of the things that people are exploring now is that the functions are actually, actually has a masculine and feminine polarity to it. So yes, I've been, I've been following that. That's, that's, really, that's really very interesting. I've been, I've been keep, that I've been keeping an eye on too. Yeah, so basically we have two masculine functions and two feminine, and every, every ENFP is apparently is different, or every type is different. Um, so basically, your, let's say your extroverted or introverted feeling could be masculine or feminine. So if it's feminine, you could come across as someone that with FE because your, your, your introverted feeling is very sensitive. So if someone tells you a joke, it's easy for you to laugh. If you see something really sad, it's easy for you to cry. But some ENFPs, they don't feel that way. For them, with masculine FI, they, they see that stuff and they kind of don't feel a huge reaction to, to, to whatever they're watching. So uh, do, you, do you agree with that? Do you, do you think there's truth to, to that? Or? Um, well, we, that would, uh, well, philosophically, I would say that would assume that there's certain emotional responses that are specifically innate to masculinity and femininity and that masculinity and femininity are these innate things right. that, that sort of exist. I'm not saying they're not, but uh, you know, if I had to backtrack it, I, I would backtrack that a little bit. Um, although I, I saying that I do like the idea because I do think that there is some masculine feminine things going on, either whether they're culturally imposed or just sort of intuitively you know, going on with us, I, I do think that. So for example, now this isn't exactly what you're talking about, but to give a parallel. And Fness, I think has a very, just in general, as a, as a collective consciousness, has a very strong feminine side to it because it's made up mostly of women. It's mostly a female consciousness. Uh, males are a minority, in an, as you know, in, in, F, in Fness. So, so there's a certain sort of understanding of the feminine or a feminine consciousness that goes on, I think, even with NF males. Uh, because of that. So I, I definitely think there's something, you know, there's something there to this. If you're asking like, what do I think for myself? I'm probably more masculine than feminine in terms of my FI. Uh, if I had to, if I had to, if I had to guess, given the, given the definition as used, as you described it. So they, they said that if you have masculine FI, that means your TE is feminine then because FI is apparent is yourself while TE is the tribe. So what works for your tribe? That's kind of the TE. Um, mm -hmm. So would you, um, would you say you're pretty flexible with your tea then more, it's more feminine, like, you know, you kind of go with the flow with people and, you know, you're more flexible. It's, you're not trying to impose anything that people should be doing. Okay. Um, again, that assumes that those are feminine traits, but let's oh. assume that they are for a minute. Yeah. Um, I would say, yes, I'm not, um, I'm very much go with the flow. Um, uh, uh, I'm in a relationship right now with, with an INFJ. And one of the things that she's always making fun of me about is I'm always telling her to adapt. 
Yeah. You know, you know you need, we need to adapt because, you know, the her plan will go awry and she'll have an INFJ meltdown as she's going right. to say INFJs alike. Right. And so I always say, like, no, get, just adapt. We're going to just, you know, we'll, just, we'll go to the bank first. Everything will be fine. You know, yeah. and so she's always making fun of me that I'm, I'm saying adapt all the time. Yeah, that we should have we should have a plaque. We should say we should have a plaque in the kitchen. You know, people have plaques in the kitchen that say yeah. like "live, live, laugh, love." We should have one that says "adapt," right. <laughs> because I say it all the time. So yeah, I would say that's true about me. So um, in what, terms of adapting, yes. adapting. Um, now I, I want to ask you for you specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. So some ENFPs are self above tribe, so they're the traditional N E F I type. But apparently, from what people are finding now, there is actually the jumper type, who are the N E T E type. So you kind of jump over the FI and go straight to TE first, and you come across as more tribe above self. So would you say you, you if, if given a chance, obviously as an ENFP, we always strive for win-win, right? But oh, absolutely, if, yeah. But if you were in that crossroad where you had to choose yourself or the tribe, who would you pick? All uh, right, I would have to define, to, what, how do you define tribe in this context? Like people close well, to What would be tribe? Events. Close, like, um, it depends. Uh, so for example, would I choose my family and my girlfriend, you know, to, for them first? Yeah, I would, you know, I, I would for lots of reasons, but would I choose like the greater, like the city I live in or, you know, some larger group? No, I would, um, uh, I, I would abandon ship. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely would. I wouldn't take, I wouldn't take a bullet for, for a larger, more abstract tribe. Gotcha. So I, I know that for sure. All right, that's very interesting, but uh, yeah. that's very defined, though. That's that's good. Yeah, like I never could have made it in the military. I never could have survived. I never could have on any level. I wouldn't have lasted a day. They would have kicked me out. <laughs> so you wouldn't you wouldn't die for your country, but you would die for your loved ones. Yes, I would. I would say I would say that I I wouldn't be able to. It would be tough. To, to it's too abstract what am i dying for am i dying for pepsi you know what am i you know that's what, you know those are the things that'd be going into my mind you know what am i actually dying for here time warner you yeah. know that, that's that's what would go into my head you'll be the first person running back in the, in the fields uh well, not only that why why do we have to like i was I used to say this why do we have to attack at dawn why can't we attack at like two what's yeah. what's going to be in that bunker at dawn that's not going to be there at two let's just let's let's have some brunch yeah. Attack, you know, full meal. Why do we attack a dog? Dawn's too early. Yeah, I couldn't do it. Sleep in a little bit. Yeah, uh, sleep in. Get some. Get a good rest. Some coffee. We're not going to attack without coffee. I'm not attacking anything without coffee. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that someone asked in that that they sent me. Um, they said, "Okay, what do you think of type elitism?" So someone trying to be elite, elite with the type. You know, like saying that this type is better than this type. You know, like oh, um, that I, you know. Uh, I understand the, the need for that developmentally, but I, I attribute that to, to youthful thinking, to okay. like teenage thinking, because teenagers want to be in a group. They want their group to be better than these mm -hmm. other groups. And certainly I understand that we get mad at the other temperaments. I get mad at the other temperaments. I get mad at every temperament. I get mad at NTs. I get mad at SP. I get mad at other NFs, you know, depending on what's going on. So certainly we get, you know, we get angry, but I don't actually think any type is better than any other type because every type has a purpose and an ability and a quality and every type has a deficit. I am sort of for though some NF empowerment because I feel that NFs get dumped on more than the other three types. Everyone says they get dumped on, but nobody gets dumped on like NFs. Nobody gets disrespected like NFs. There's always this appropriate, so for example, there's always this appropriating of NF intellectuals throughout time that the NFs who are actually great thinkers are actually somehow NTs. Like Jane Austen is somehow an NT. Jane Austen is not an NT. That's crazy. Okay. An NT did not write Pride and Prejudice. That's impossible. Can't, can't be. You know, there's always sort of this like, you can't pop. That person wrote something really good. It came up with a really great idea. It can't possibly be an NF. So I am, I am for some NF empowerment for NFs to sort of stand up for themselves and say, hey, you know, we have, intu we have intuitive functions and we're, we're a smart bunch. You know, we're a capable bunch. I feel that the rest of the temperaments don't understand us the way we understand them. And I, I think we get beat up a lot. So I, I do think NFs should be, should be empowered. But I don't think that any type is necessarily better than every other type because every type has, a, has an environmental context where they succeed better than any other type. That's what I would say. So um, to, to follow up on your um, reply just now, um, I heard that the main reason why people dump on NFs 
is because we're not very sensory clear when we explain things. It's a lot of like woo-woo talk, as they would, I guess, say, you know, talking about energies, crystals, uh, magic, um, ener- uh, you know, like vibes. And, and you know, like p- people who are more sensory dominant would not understand what's happening, um, you know, with, with what we're, I, I get it, I get it completely if, you, if, if I talk to an NF and they start talking about this stuff. I understand it completely. And to me, it oh, makes yeah. sense. But like, you know, if, if you were to talk to someone that is, let's say, an SJ or an SP, right? And and you start saying all this NF stuff, you know, some of them will not get what you're saying. They just will give you a blank look and they just think you're crazy, you know? So what... what... Sure. The first thing I would say is, is um, let's call it what it is. Don't, don't use their language. It's not, we're not talking about crystals and magic. We speak in metaphor. We speak in the language of metaphor and symbolism. And uh, we don't, so no, we don't speak directly or concretely. That's not the language we speak. We speak in a much more poetic, metaphoric language, okay, of, 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 of symbols, of art, of expression, things like that. Um, but yeah, it does come easy. I, I remember, um, you know, it's funny to say that I, when I was, I remember when I was 15, we were reading in, um, in high school, reading Romeo and Juliet. And it made very, I, and, and this is where I look back and I realize I was an NF. Shakespeare came very easy to me. It still does. It comes very easy. I read it once. I, I get it. I don't need like 10 million translations. I can kind of get my way through it. And I remember one time reading Romeo and Juliet. And it's one of those things where kids were all reading it out loud at our desks really slowly and boringly. And I was, you know, they're doing a terrible job. So I read ahead. I read ahead to the end of the act, you know, or, or whatever, and because I want to see what happened. And I got to the end, and I was done. And so I just sat back and started spacing out. And I went to a Catholic high school, and um, and Sister Rose, that was her name, screamed at me. She yelled at me. She said, "Pay attention, Boudria!" Rah, 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 rah. And I, like I jumped up, and she thought like I wasn't paying attention. I didn't care when I had actually had already read to the end of the act and was like done. And I was just waiting for everybody uh, to catch up. So yeah, we have an affinity to that. What I would say to other NFs is that there's nothing wrong with that language, but I don't think there's anything wrong with changing your language to the type you're speaking to. You know, when I'm, I, you know, I have a, you know, if, you, if you've watched NF Geeks, anybody who watched NF Geeks knows that I have an ISTJ son. And so when I'm talking to him, I don't bring up any NF stuff ever. I don't talk to him about NF things because he's not going to get, he's just going to make fun of me. He's just going to like, you know, you know, insult me. So I don't talk about it. I talk about, you know, if I want him to do something, if I want him to understand something, I speak about it in SJ terms, you know, using SJ values, uh, you know, for him to get it. I don't think, you know, I think that's our gift as NFs. We have the ability because we're NFs, we can understand the other temperaments and types better than they can understand us. And we can speak their language. They can't speak our language. No, SJs can't speak it. SBs can't speak it. They can't speak it. But we can speak theirs. So, 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 so speak theirs. That's what I would say to my fellow NFs. Speak. When you're talking to SJ, speak SJ. It's, it's wrong. To, you know, granted, you know, a lot of people expect NFs to be SJs, NTs, whatever. We get, you know, and that hurts us. But it's also wrong to do the opposite. It's wrong to expect an SJ to be all NF about something and be mad that they're not. That's asking them to be something they can't possibly be. You know, that's wrong. An SJ is going to be an SJ and SP is going to be an SP, whatever. So speak the language as they understand it. That, that's what I would say. All right. Uh, two follow-up questions for that. Uh, number one. Sure. Um, have you seen the movie Arrival? Uh, no. Arrival I haven't seen. Okay. So I'll, I'll give you the basic gist of it. Um, sure. Oh, I know it's about the aliens. They're trying to talk. They, they, they're talking to, you know, they're, they're, they, they talk in sentences that, that transcend time, something like that. I know the story, right? Is that the same story? Am I getting yeah, it right? So, so basically when the aliens put out a symbol, that symbol yes. is essentially like, like a whole, like a, it's either, either several paragraphs or yes. it's, like, it's like an entire book, but it's like just one symbol, right? Right. So I, I think a lot of times, um, a lot of NFs get a lot of flack for this. Um, just because we're not backing up what we're saying, but you know, when, whenever we talk to someone, I, we pick up so many things just from their facial expressions. Oh, absolutely. And, and like, yeah, absolutely. Just, just a micro movement in people's muscles. We pick it up so quickly that we know exactly what just happened. But when people, when we, when we talk about it, people just think we're crazy. How do you know that? Right. But then we can't, we can't explain it. So do you, do you agree that it's for NFs? It's like a special scale that. You, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That is our gift. Our gift is that the ability to read people. I always know when I'm being lied to always, 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 even as a boy, I knew, I just don't as a perceiver in an ENFP, I don't know what to do about it. 
I don't have any judgment. Someone's lying to me. What do I do? Do I go with it? Do I not go with it? You know, again, all things are equal. I have no idea. So I end up doing nothing. But it's not because I'm not aware. I'm never shocked by the lie. I'm never ever like, what? You mean they were trying to pull the wool over? That's never happened in my life. So, yeah, absolutely. We, We definitely have that wonderful ability to read people correctly and accurately i think that's that's particularly true of enfp because of our our strength in ne is that we're very able we're able to get into the motivation of what's going on in a moment what's actually going on to get right past all the surface nonsense right to behind it i think the one the types that have ni like infj what they're good at is that they're good at predicting the final outcome of these events you know what i mean they've read they've read a person and they're like okay this person is you know, a sociopath (laughs) or this person is, you know, this or that or the other thing. And because of that, here is the final, the final outcome of all these things is going to be X. You know, they can get to X. That's what they can do. What we can do is say, this is what this person is doing right now, you know, in the moment. But yeah, we absolutely have that ability and I'm, and we should be proud of it. And then we don't have to justify it. And this is what I mean by enough empowerment. We don't have to justify it to the other types. Okay. So they can't see it. Okay, fine. That doesn't mean it's wrong. And I, and it doesn't mean we have to change our opinion about it. I think we get all caught up in that, like the SJs can't see it, so there must be something wrong with us, we must be crazy, or we have to constantly like try to logically explain it to NTs who really don't want to explain to them, they just want to debate because they love that tennis match. Yeah. You know, they they yeah. love it, they just love it. And I don't blame them, that's not a criticism, they love it, that's what they like, that's what yeah. they're into, you know? So, but I, I think that as NFs, be confident in your ability. If they, they can't see it, they're not gonna see it, don't expect them to see it. What if, what if they're really um, curious, find out how you saw what you saw? Like, you know, like, okay, you, you're saying this. I can't see it. So tell me, how do you see it? How are you seeing this? Like, what if, okay, sure. Um, like, what if they, right. just, yeah, they want you to this justify is, okay, it? This is, this is what I mean by think about their type. Yeah. If this was my son asking me, yeah. my son is dominant SI, you know, SJ, SI, which means... Oh. He, his whole existence internally is memory. Right. So what I need to go is I need to go back and give him specific incidences that happened. Like, do you remember when this happened? Do you remember when that happened? Remember the day this happened? Remember when that happened? You know, give him this catalog of events that yeah. he can then follow. Right. So if I, was, if I was explaining it to him, I wouldn't necessarily get into the symbolism of it or the theory of it, you know, or, you know, if I'm using some sort of psychological paradigm or something, right. I would just go into, you know, okay, here, remember on this day when this happened and then this, I would catalog, and I've done that, I would catalog these past events for him because that's what he needs as an SJ. And would you, would you connect these events for him and E-Styles? Like say, you know, this event is related to this event and this is what happened because of this and this. No, because he's SJ and he's like a robot and you got to do it in chronological order. Oh, okay. You can't, you can't get all Pulp Fiction about it. Forget it. It's, 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 no. You it's going to be chronological. Um, of, the, of when you did that, like to your son? Uh, yeah, you know, um, I, I think I might have talked about this on NF Geeks, but I'll remember we were at his his grandfather's funeral, his, his mother's father's funeral. You know, he was old and, and passed away. And his, his mother had told him, um, you know, because I, I live in New England and I live in Red Sox Nation. So they, his mother had told him, look, you know, your grandfather was big into the Red Sox. So we're all going to wear Red Sox things when we go to the dinner after the, after the burial. Okay. So I, you got, I, you know, I bought your shirt, I bought your Red Sox shirt, make sure, because he was with me. So I said, you know, make sure your father put you in all these things. And we were outside waiting, you know, we, we'd gotten there first and we were waiting for his mother to show up. And suddenly I had this NF moment and I turned to him. I said, Noah, everybody's not wearing Red Sox stuff. Just you and your mom and, and maybe your mom's husband are wearing Red Sox. You're going to be the only person in this thing. It's going to be a hundred people in there and only everyone else is going to be wearing suits. You're going to be wearing Red Sox. And he said, Come on, no, what? Because he'd, he'd had enough NF stuff that he knew that I was probably right. And he yeah. was like, why? What makes you think that? And I said, okay, so remember um, the way your mom said it when she was looking at you. She wasn't looking at me. Um, and then I, I listened some other time. Remember the time where it was Easter and you had to wear something and it was really just you wearing it and I didn't even have to wear it. You were a boy, you were eight. And I went through these whole things. And sure enough, it was right. Only, you know, she showed up and they're all in their Red Sox gear and the rest of us, everyone else going up into this restaurant are wearing black suits, you know, ties, yeah. funeral. Because that's appropriate that's what you're supposed right. to wear but he was a good sj son he said he would put on that red Sox. he doesn't even like the red Sox. he doesn't even watch sports yeah 
you know, he doesn't care. But his mom, you know, he's an S, he's an ISTJ. His mom said, put that on. He put it on. He did it. So, you know, after explaining it to him and, and taking him through when the mother, you know, he, he realized it was happening. So things like that. If you got it, but you got to go chronological with it. If you don't go chronological, it he, for him as an ISTJ, right? That he he won't get it. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a good story. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. One. But speak. But 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 we can do this, especially ENFPs. But all the NFs can do this. Speak to the temperament or the type you're talking to. If you're talking to an NT, speak NT. You know, speak the way they want to hear it. Okay. Don't talk about your NFness and your feelings and don't you have any empathy? No, they forget all that. Keep it theoretical. Keep it, you know, reasonably consistent. If you're going to be with SPs, SPs want to know how is, how is this going to make their life practical now? How is this going to make their, their life more fun now? Keep it all in the now. Don't, don't talk about the past. Don't talk about the future. They can't see that. Talk about now and this, oh, this is going to help you right now. And it's going to be fun for you right now. Gotcha. So that, and we can do that quickly. Yeah. Now, as an ENFP, I, I would say I'm pretty good at reading what type people are just after a few minutes of talking to them. Like I, I sure. already tell, and I'm pretty sure you can do that as well. Oh um, yeah. Now, do you think the other NFs can do that or is it just like an ENFP kind of, kind of power, superpower? Okay. I, I think, and, 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 and there's going to be a lot of flack for this, <laughs> but, that's a, but that's all right. I always got a lot of flack. I think the dominant intuitives are best at this. To be honest, all four of us, which would be ENFP, INFJ, INTJ, and ENTP. I think that all the four dominant intuitives are the best at typing. And that doesn't mean that INFPs suck or something. They certainly don't. My, my, Bill Myers herself was an INFP for crying out loud. So yeah, of course, the other types can do it. But I think that the dominant intuitives are particularly, are particularly good at it. Most INFJs I know are very good at typing, uh, at typing people. Most INTJs I know are actually very good at it. You know, that's why I, I always pay attention to Dave superpowers. Like you brought up Dave superpowers. Yeah. I always, you know, people bring it to me. I always like, you know, take a look, what's going on. What's he saying? What's this about? Uh, you know, INTJs, um, INTJs are very careful. You know, they don't want to be wrong. They want to be correct. They want things to be factual. So they're willing to take the time to make sure it's right before they put anything out there. Right. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, they're not just going to wing it, you know, they say, you I know, <laughs> Yeah. So I, you know, I appreciate that, but I think it's, a, I think it's anybody with the dominant intuitives that are very good. So do I think that ENFPs are very good? Yes. My, uh, my girlfriend and I play a game, guess the driver. Like we, it's, it's not really real typing, but we try to guess the type just on what the car looks like, what the bumper stickers are and how they're driving. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? We try to do that. We try, and, and the specific game we're playing is spot the ESFJ. We, we play this game like, where's, which car is the ESFJ? Which is the most self-absorbed, I'm the only person on this road vehicle? <laughs> you know, that's, let's see if that's the ESFJ. You know, we, it's not really serious typing, but it's kind of a fun thing. It's just, just a game? Yeah, it's just a game to pass the time, you know, going to the supermarket. You know? ESFJs are asking themselves, are, 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 am I self-absorbed? I'm just kidding. No. Uh, um, so one question that someone asked me to ask you is, um, do you think personality disorder is linked to personality types? Like to a specific ah, I, yes, I do. I actually think, and, and again, this is a hypothesis. I don't have data, but my hypothesis is that certain types and temperaments have certain types of disorders. So there's a, cl there's clustering. That's how I, I call it in my mind. There's clusters. There's certain disorders that are specific to NFs. There are certain disorders that are specific to NTs. There's certain disorders that are specific to SJs. Um, I think that, that and, and I would say that's also true then about personality disorders. I think certain personality disorders lend themselves to specific types. And also if we're gonna take types seriously, I don't think so for example, I. I don't think you can be an NF and be a full on sociopath. I think you could be an NF and be a narcissist. I think you could be an NF and be a megalomaniac, but I don't think you can be a full on sociopath because to be a sociopath, you know, like a serial killer, you know, or, or a con artist, you know, somebody running a Ponzi scheme, you have to have zero empathy. You have, there can be no empathic triggers in you whatsoever. So by that alone, that negates the possibility of an NF being a sociopath. Now, by saying that, to, to get back to the type of elitist, elitist stuff, that doesn't mean NFs are all good angelic people. I can tell you that right now. 
You know, NFs are jerks just like anybody else. But I think that there's certain types of jerks. So for, so for example, this is a personality disorder, but um, NFs aren't the type, NFs aren't the type to do mass shootings. NFs are the type to self-destruct and take people with them on the self-destruct. So NFs aren't going to run into a mall and shoot people in a mall, but an NF may start a cult and then talk everybody into the cult, into killing themselves. So they can go to the, you know, the 17th plane of existence and, you know, whatever, and okay. raise our consciousness, that kind of stuff we would do. So I think there's disorders specific to the type. In terms of personality disorders, certain personality disorders, I think, lend themselves to certain types. I don't, I don't think there's a lot of histrionic NTs. Histrionic seems very FI, ESFP, ENFP. You know, I, I definitely think there's clusters. Absolutely. I think my roommate at one point had histrionic. <laughs> really? Like, yeah, my, I had an INFJ roommate at one point and he, 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 couldn't, um, he couldn't stand not being the center of attention all the time. He would purposely, uh, you know, start talking about his personal life that is, I think people refer to it as floodlighting. Like he would talk about openly talk about his himself without permission first from other people. Right. You know, like people don't want to hear about it, you know, unless you've got, they've gotten to know you. So, right. And he was clearly, he was an INFJ. So it was kind of weird because he's an INFJ and I'm an ENFP. We're supposed to get along really well, but that was like roommate from hell for me. Uh, All so, right. I would, I would guess. And again, I don't know him from a hole in the wall, yeah. but I would revisit that because my guess is that he was probably mistyped. It's more likely he was mistyped than you were mistyped. You're not, you seem like an ENFP, so you're probably an ENFP. But if yeah. there was a real disconnect, he probably wasn't an INFJ. Well, so we, the, we, we got along. We just couldn't live together. You know, like it's... That's too bad. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, like I said, there's just a lot of... I, you know what? Maybe it has nothing to do with his type. Maybe it's his upbringing, you know? Uh, you know, so that, that could have been the factor. Yeah, sure. There's other factors that go on. Type isn't... I think type is foundational to a certain extent, but it's not all encompassing. Right. Um, so since we're in this topic, um, someone asked me to ask you about this. What do you think about the MBTI compatibility with other types, like, you know, with relationship and friendship? Oh, yes. I actually have my own um, typology uh, compatibility theory that I'm going to put out on NF Geeks that I've been thinking about for years. It might be my big contribution to typology, oh, yeah. yes. Awesome. And so I do think there's definitely, there's degrees of compatibility, okay, between, uh, between the types. And that some types you're gonna automatically be better compatible with than others, um, based on how the functions sort of fit together. And the way I look at it is that, you know, is that introverted and extroverted functions are also speaking and listening functions. You speak with your extroverted function. You listen with your introverted function. How well is that fitting together? I think that determines the, the various um, the ways things are compatible. So, for example, I would say that – so I'll give this nugget of it – is that I, I believe that compatibility is – for best compatibility is based on sharing the dominant – whether you have – sharing the perceiver function, either as dominant or auxiliary. So all dominant – intuitives are a good match for each other. All auxiliary intuitives are a good match for each other. All dominant sensors are a good match for each other. All auxiliary sensors are a good match for each other. So that gives you four groups of four. So any of those, so I would say those are probably your best compatibility matches. So for example, so for us as ENFP, I would say our best matches for compatibility are another ENFP, INFJ, INTJ, or ENTP. Now, people always ask me what, because I've talked about this before, like in the, in the Crystal Starcastle group, they know all about this, they're sick of it. And they ask me, well, is there a, is there a hierarchy between that? Like, is, is this, should ENFPs always go with INTJ or something? And no, I don't think so. I think it's, that's where preference comes in. Uh, one ENFP may really like INTJs. Another ENFP may really like another ENFP. You know, it, it depends. But I definitely think compatibility is focused on sharing the same same perceiver function and sharing it either as dominant, like you have dominant intuitive with dominant intuitive or auxiliary intuitive, auxiliary intuitive like that. And not whether or not it's introverted or extroverted. I, don't, I think that's a red herring. I mean, it, it'll manifest different things for certain. You know, it's different. Being with a fellow NE is different is different than being with somebody who has an NI. You know, it's a different experience. But I would still say they're both compatible. 
Um, they're, they're both compatible. The question is, are they both dominant or are they both auxiliary? That's, that's the, that's my little nugget I'll share. Gotcha. That, that kind of makes sense. My girlfriend's in, in if you like me. So, uh, Oh yeah, I would often, that's great. You know, I would love to have been with the a fellow ENFP. I mean, we wouldn't get anything done, but it would be a lot of fun. Like I would, I could definitely, you know, do you want to get ice cream two in the morning? Well, yeah, let's go. You know, yeah. you know it, it would be, it would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, you're right about not getting anything done. But uh, well, we, I, I'm actually forced to be the police, so it's kind of tough. But uh. Well, that, that's funny. I've, I've often thought that if um, – Someone has to take the role, I think. Yes. If, if, if you're with your sort of your twin type, yeah. that one of you automatically sort of becomes like the SJ. You know what I mean? One becomes a little more SJ than the other. The other becomes more the SP or whatever. There's a little thing yeah. that goes on, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's me. I'm I'm the person that has to. Well, it, it it depends. It's not it's not so clear black and white, right? Like, um, my my girlfriend is more the SJ in the long term side of things, where because I'm more uh, flighty or you could say scattered when it comes to long term. Like in a way that like I always want to be free. I want to do like travel around the world, you know, and do that kind of stuff. But for her, she's like, no, I want to settle down, you know, get a stable job, um, you know have a dog, you know, like it has to be like kind of like the nine to five kind of pathway. But for me, I'm kind of against that. I want a more unconventional lifestyle. However, sure. when it comes to more practical stuff in day-to-day life, um, she is not as practical as I am. Like for, for me, for example, I'm like, okay, I, I have an Excel sheet of all our spending. So to make sure, because we live together. So make sure that, you know, we're not, you know, overspending. Like also see our spending behavior because I'm, I'm, I'm tracking to see where our money's going, right? So so when it comes to, you know, spending habits, doing taxes, accounting, um, I'm more on top of that while she's kind of like, yeah, yeah I don't care, you know, you know, so there, there's definitely like, there's some areas in our life where she's taking an SJ role and some areas I'm taking the SJ role. So it's not, hmm. clear, it's not clear cut. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's true. It's, you know, um, like I said, I'm in a relationship with an INFJ and a common discussion that we have is that, um, you know, she calls putting away my clothes cleaning and I call it gaslighting <laughs> because, you know, if I put my sweatshirt on the couch, I expect it to be on the couch when I come back, yeah, you know, yeah, put exactly. it on. That's where I put it. What do you mean? What's it doing in a drawer? It doesn't yeah. belong in a drawer. It belongs draped over the couch. That's, yeah. that's where yeah. it goes. You know? yeah. no, I, I get what you said. My, my girlfriend does that all the time, actually. Um, yeah. Just leave shit all over the floor and I have to pick up after. <laughs> um, so I, I want to ask you, uh, do you know much about the Enneagram or do you believe in it? Ah, I, I do because I feel like I'm forced to because people who are into MBTI love the Enneagram. And so I, I and I'm not saying I don't like it or anything, but like I, I kind of went into it like, okay, I have to understand what everybody's talking about. So I have to yeah. understand these terms right. in order to understand it. I, uh, so I am familiar with it. And, um, and I have, I, I'm going to be honest, I have mixed feelings about it. Now, mixed feelings doesn't mean I hate it. I mean, there's things I do like about it. I like the, the instinctual variant stacking things, you know, like the you know, SOSX, all that. That's very good. I like that. That's interesting. And I, and I like the whole, you know, the numerical system. Um, I know what I am. I'm a two wing one, you know, uh, that's what I, you know, that's my thing. And I, and I own it. And when I read two wing one things, I go, oh, yeah, that's, that makes sense. You know, that's right. My, my fear about it, is that I feel that people use the Enneagram to justify their mistype, that people use the Enneagram in a way that when confronted with their mistype, they, they use it to block the fact that they're mistyped. So I'm not a mistyped, I'm not an INTP mistyped as an INFJ, I'm an INFJ5. Um, I'm not an INFP mistyped as an INFJ, I'm, uh, uh, I'm an INFJ4. You know, whatever you know, they you know they use the numbers to sort of rationalize why they're not fitting into their type when right. that's brought to them. That you makes know, sense in a way. So now that's not uh, that doesn't mean that I think that Enneagram and MBTI are incompatible. I don't. Um, but I I'm wary of how it's used online in the forums. That's when I observe. That's that's my concern with it. So it's not it's not the system. I don't have any problem with the the way the system's organized. You know, they're just cutting the pie different ways uh you know nine slices as opposed to 16 I, I i'm fine with that i um but i think that people use it to justify an obvious mistype that's that's my concern yeah that, that makes perfect sense I've, I've seen that uh quite a bit yeah yeah 
Uh, now, I want to jump into questions about ENFP specifically. Um, okay. You're, 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 um, you're an older ENFP, so I think you have, oh, a, yeah. you have a lot of wisdom to impart to younger people. So Sure. <laughs> if, if, if someone is an ENFP and they're a teenager, what, what, what kind of things do you think would, would you say they would be uh, um, having obstacles with or struggles with, and what can they do to kind of overcome that? You know? Okay. Sure. Or, okay. That's, 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 a, that's not a bad question. I can yeah. answer that one. Yeah. Don't, even though this is hard because you're talking to a teenager, don't internalize the SJ worldview. Because the SJ worldview is going to look at ENFP and say, you're good for nothing. You can't do this. You can't do that. You can't hold a job. You can't, you know, there, there's nothing in ENFP-ness that SJs value. So SJs dump on ENFPs. And so ENFPs try to do SJ things early on in life. Get a real job and I'm going to be an accountant and I'm going to be, you know, and go down these career paths that are, are end up being miserable. That the, you're never going to please your, your SJ family. <laughs> you're never going to please SJ society because you're an ENFP. So don't, don't listen to it. Okay. Don't, don't, well, listen to it, but don't internalize it. Don't internalize the negative message. Um, ENFPs need to be on their own path. I would encourage ENFP teenagers to go down a creative path. If I had to go back in time to my teenage self, that's what I would have told myself. I would say, you know what, go into art, go into to film, go into cartoons, go into acting. Go down um, a performance art or a creative art or, or, or something and you'll be happy. I wish I, I had done that. Um, and don't listen to everybody that you won't make money and you won't do this, you won't do that. You'll be fine. Um, don't internalize the SJ need to like, you have to work nine to five and you have to know how to do all these things. You know, find your ENFP path now before you get old and it's too late. <laughs> like me, like now it's too late. I'm going to be 50. What, can I do? Um, you know? what about the ENFP in their twenties now? So the twenties is kind of like an interesting age, right? Cause you're, sure. like, you're, you're kind of exploring yourself, exploring your options. Yes. And uh, so this is a very critical path for a lot of ENFPs in their twenties. So what do you, what would you say to the ENFPs in their twenties? Um, so, because you know, if, if they, if they, yeah, if, I know exactly what to say. Ready? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Don't, don't get married until you're 30. Okay. Don't get married until I'm going to say it three times. Don't get married until you're 30, at least 30. Okay. So use that time to do all your ENFP romantic adventuring. Because that's what ENFPs do. They go on romantic adventures. So fine. Go on your romantic adventures. But don't, but don't get married. Don't do it. Don't be pressured into it from SJs or whatever. Explore those things. You're not mature enough to get. No ENFP is mature enough to get married in the 20s. Say that right now. None of us. I wasn't. No, no one is. Wait till you're 30. Gotcha. You know, and, then, and then settle down and commit. Because look, ENFPs want to be in relationships. We want to be, you know, we don't want to be flighty around, but we end up going on these, you know, they're, they're accidental romantic adventures sometimes. So they just sort of happen to us. Yeah. You know, you, you know it's, it's, we're not even trying. And <laughs> it happens. So get that all out of your system in your 20s. In terms of career, if you listen to the teenage advice, you should be fine. Gotcha. <laughs> so it's more it's relationship advice I would give to 20s. Got it. So um, next question is to the 30s. I'm, I'm in my 30s right now, so this question is sure. directly. Okay, good. You, you can get married if yeah. you so choose. Yeah. You have to choose. Um, so my, my question is, the 30s is kind of like the age where you have to now pick a path. And, yes. And, and, and so what, what would you say to the ENFPs now in the 30s, face with a the decision, they have to pick a path now? How yeah, I, I absolutely understand that because I had that same thing. Yeah. I was, you know, because, again, this, this, very much a, this is very much an – aimed at ENFPs. You know, everybody loves a Maverick, but everybody wishes the Maverick was something more than just a Maverick. Right. You know, so it's, you know, thirties is the time to, to do it. I, I actually am kind of conflicted on this one because there's a part of me that says, you know, follow your any, follow your heart. Okay. That you should, that you should do that and you'll be fine. And uh, the reason why I'm conflicted is because that is what I did in my thirties. And I'm, and at that time I wasn't unhappy about it. I originally was getting, um, I was originally on a path to get a PhD in psychology. I was in a master's program that led to a PhD program for psychology. And I hated it because it's so NT you, people, NFs have no idea how NT it is. It's NT beyond your wildest imaginations that, that, that path. So I went into the humanities, which was far more NF and I excelled 
and I did great and I was glad I did it. But um, to be honest, in terms of like practical stuff, like finding a job and stuff, nobody cares about the humanities. Nobody cares that I've read, you know, the complete works of William Shakespeare. <laughs> you, know, yeah. nobody, you know, nobody cares that I, that I know, you know, which Bronte sister wrote what, you know, nobody cares. So it's harder now. So I'm conflicted to say, follow your path. But if I had to be honest with myself, I really don't regret the choice I made in my thirties. I just regret that society sucks <laughs> so much. But yeah. so I would still say, choose the path that your heart is telling you to go in as an ENFP, you know, that path. And don't get caught up in, again, the SJ internalization stuff. Follow the path that you're meant to path, you're meant to be on in terms of your heart, in terms of your interests, whatever those are, no matter how wacky they are, you know, follow them. That's what I would say to do. Because look, I did start off practical. Again, psychology was very practical and it was miserable. Okay, I didn't just take research methods. I took advanced research methods. A class, any ENFP would put a gun in their mouth. Yeah. Uh, you know, awful. Okay, factor analysis, terrible. I can't even believe I did it. Now that I look back um, on myself. So I took the, pra yeah, I took that first practical path and I was miserable. I went into the humanities and I loved it and I excelled. And I, and I, and I flew through it because I, I was, you know, I was doing what I was meant to be studying, you know, that my NFness was good at doing. So even though I'm at an age where I'm like, oh, why did I do all that? Because I don't teach anymore. I'm out, I'm out of teaching. There was just no money in it, you know, for somebody in the humanities. Uh, but I, I still don't regret the decision. I'm glad I still did it. So I would say go on that path, the way your heart is telling you. If it's telling you to go down a wacky NF path, go down your wacky NF path. You're not going to be happy because here's the thing. Even if it's fruitless, let's assume, I know that's pessimistic. Yeah. Let's assume it's fruitless. Yeah. It's still going to be better than going down an SJ path that's going to feel like you're grinding your face against sandpaper every step of the way. Yeah. You know, some other practical path that you're just going to hate every step. You know, you can like, well, yeah, you know, accountants make a lot of money. Maybe I should, I'm 30, I should go be an accountant. You will hate getting your accountant's license. Every second of it you'll hate. Why yeah. do that to yourself? Well, so that's I mean, what I would say. I mean, you know, the NFs, we still have to pay our, more, you know, we still have to get a mortgage. We still have to pay the bills. Oh, yeah, sure. I got a ton of bills. You have no idea. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> yeah. is, is following your heart going to pay the bills and get the mortgage? No, 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 it's not. But to be honest, and I'm not speaking, I can't speak for you, but I can speak as myself as an ENFP. Yeah. yeah. In the end, I really don't care. I mean, yeah, it's important. And yeah, I have responsibilities, but I'm not going to work at a miserable job and go i'm not going to go down a path in life that i'm going to hate that's going to want to make me want to kill myself because yeah. it's so miserable i'd rather just sort of suffer through it and find a way to pay these bills and still keep my nf integrity intact because at least i'll have some happiness in that because uh, you won't find happiness i mean it, again i you know i tried i tried going down that path that was miserable i've tried many work? times what did you make it work though for yourself like financially it um, I, I could, I mean, I've been okay. I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm not panhandling, <laughs> you know, I'm not on the, I'm not on the street. I have a, you know, I, I have a life and I have a car and yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's food. I mean, I survived. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not living in a refrigerator box under a highway bridge. So, I mean, yeah, it's tough because you you get, you internal, it's, again, it's easy. I think maybe because of FI and it'd be interesting to see if INFPs have this problem. It's easy to internalize SJ criticism. Yes. Of our lifestyle. You know, when are you going to grow up? When are you going to have a, you know, when are you going to have a real job? When are you going to have, you know, do these things that we're supposed to be doing? Yeah. When are you going to care about money? Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's easy to, especially for me, I grew up with all SJs. I grew up under SJ fascism, you know, so it's, it's, it's an old, for me, it's an old voice. It's an no, old I'm voice. I'm uh, an SJ kid too. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and, and I'll tell you, it never leaves you. Like my family, you know, my, again, my, I'm, I'm older. My family was older. You know, my, my family have passed on. Yeah. And yet they're, 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 their ghosts linger. The SJ ghosts and their voices linger even now, you know, going into my, my 50s. You know, they, they linger. I'm, I'm not unhappy with the choice. It's been hard because you'd want it, you'd wish that it would be more rewarding um, at this stage in my life. But I don't regret doing it in my 30s. So if there's a path, I would still say go on it. The other paths, you will not find happiness. This is the, the, your, your NF path for your heart is the only hope you have of happiness. 
It may not come out the way you thought it was going to come out, but at least there's hope. There's no hope for an ANFP going down an SJ path. No hope. Okay, that, that's a good advice. Yeah. That last question about this topic. You're in your tail end of your 40s now. Yes. Uh, if you can do your 40s again, how would you have done it differently? Um, I would have slept through all of them and self-medicated. I think that's what I would have done. My <laughs> 40s were the worst decade of my life, I can how, easily how say. About? Um, it, lots of reasons. I, um, it, it's several reasons. One is, uh, again, part of this is uh, this NF stuff is that, um, I've had to sort of switch careers again. I mean, I know that's such an ENFP thing to do and we do it yeah. all the time, right. but I didn't really want to, I, oh. I, I didn't want to, I felt sort of, I had to, I, you know, I, I don't, so I don't teach anymore because when I did the videos, I used to teach, I don't teach anymore because there's just no money. There's no money in humanities for teaching. It's, you have to be adjunct. And if you know anything about college, to be adjunct faculty is to basically be an indentured servant and, and you know, and have nothing. There's no, there's no money. There's no insurance. There's, there's no, you can't live. So I, I sort of had to stop doing it. Um, there's that. And also, um, I, I sort of uh, had some failed relationships in my early 40s that definitely did a, did a toll on me because – you know, it's okay to have sort of romantic escapades in your 20s as an ENFP, but I, but I found that in my 40s, it, it, it hit me harder. Like, you know, you know, I don't want to just be like dating and having romantic adventures and sexual escapades. And, you know, I really don't, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that man. If I was an SP, maybe I wouldn't care and I'd do it to the grave, you know, but I'm not an SP, I'm an NF and I have a heart and I don't want this for myself. And I began to wonder if it's possible, you know, is, is love really in the cards for me or any ENFP, not, not to depress you, but that's what I was thinking. Like, is it, you know, can, can ENFP really have a sustainable relationship? with somebody in spite of wanting, I mean, every, every ENFP I know wants to be in a relationship. They don't want to, they, they end up in sort of romantic silliness, but they really want to be in a regular relationship, a loving soulmate, you know, NFs want soulmates and ENFPs are, are NFs and we want soulmates, but is ENFP wackiness too strong to ever actually find your soulmate? I kind of wrestled with that, that idea for a long time uh, throughout my forties too and then also just just regular stuff of aging you know it's funny now but because um i i had, over the winter i had a big beard it was it was the largest i'd ever had it yeah. i trimmed it for the for the spring but it was huge it was like if you, we had done this in december it was like santa claus it was oh. very big and <laughs> it's you know it's very gray and if you can see now there's a lot of gray in it yeah. and when i was when i was in my mid 40s if i had a little patch of gray or white i was mortified i was like i'm so old i'm dying yeah. you know now i love it i love my green you know, I've, I've gone past middle age now you know like going to my 50s i like all my gray hair i'm happy with it but i found that you know as I, as I discovered my own aging, that was also impacting me. Like, oh, no, you know, I'm getting old. But I'm not going to do all these crazy things. I'm not going to start coloring my hair. Like, that's something I discovered, too. Like, I see friends from high school, you know, either on Facebook or just in life, and none of them were gray. And I thought, oh, my God, am I eating something wrong? Am I, what am I doing? I didn't <laughs> even, you know? And then I realized those SOBs are coloring the hair. Yeah. You know, then it like it dawned on me, like they're great too. They're just, you know, they just can't take it. So they've gotten into coloring their hairs. Uh, yeah. You know, that, that's what they're doing. Now, when I really looked at it, I realized, look how dark it is. It's, his hair's darker than it was 30 years ago. How can that be? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so I thought to myself, do I want to go down that road? And I thought, I mean, as an ENFP, no, there's something sort of anti ENFP integrity about coloring your hair. <laughs> you know, it's anti, it's not authentic. If I'm going to be gray, then I authentically should be gray. You know, and that's why I am now at 50, I think that, but sort of like that process though, in the forties really bothered me. Like, Oh, I'm getting gray. I'm old. You know, that's, no, not, I'm fine. that's almost scary hearing that from you, you know, cause I'm in my mid thirties now and I'm, that's going to be like the next hump for me. And then for you, it's, you're telling me how, how horrible it was, you know, your forties was. Yeah. Forties were miserable. We're absolutely, I feel better now. It's been the past year or two hasn't been too bad. It's been yeah. pretty good. Even though like I'm definitely physically feeling older. Like I have ailments, like I'm now getting to that age. Like I know I'm getting older because I'll get an ailment. I'll get sick and it won't go away. Like it just won't go away. You know, I'll twist my leg. I'll, 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 I'll twist my leg in a hole in a parking lot, you know, or something. And I'll, it'll sort of be sprained for like a week. Like it just won't, you know what I mean? It won't heal. Things just don't heal now. They just sort of stay with you. You know, I'm at that stage, but I don't feel bad about it. I mean, I, I'm actually happier now than I was say five years ago. 
Oh, five nice. or six years ago. Yeah. Yeah, but 40 sucked. It was terrible and worst decade of my life easily. And now, what did you switch your jobs to? You know, because you stopped teaching, right? Yeah, I, um, I did a couple of things. I used to, this, is a, this would have been a fun, this was a fun job, but right job for ENFP, wrong decade. Uh, but I worked oh. at, a, at a radio station oh, for wow. a couple of years. I had my own talk show um, awesome. on, on AM radio. Yeah, it was actually very fun. And I learned a lot. And, you know, ENFPs love to learn things. No one's like any, you know, very curious. Yeah. And I learned a lot about media, about how, how news works, yeah. how, how politics works, how politics works within the media, what's going on with that. I learned a lot. Uh, so I did that for a while. But again, no money because this is the 21st century. <laughs> and, you know, radio is about to disappear. Right, with, right. With television. I mean, maybe it's got 10 years left, if that. Uh, but I did that for a while. And then I just, I tried to go, NF, like, save the world. I actually worked for a year in a methadone clinic. Okay. Um, I did intakes at a, at a methadone clinic and saw that. And I also learned a lot with that. I learned horrible, horrible things <laughs> with that. But I did learn a lot. Um, uh, and now I'm sort of getting out of that job and, and trying to do some other stuff, you know, at the moment. But, um, but, it, but it was learned. I learned a lot of things. I learned how to run a Lego scam. Did you know that? <laughs> It's a real thing, Lego scams. What's a Lego scam? Okay, this is great. So to get money to buy heroin, what addicts will do is they'll they'll send their girlfriends into like Walmart or Target and steal Legos. Now they'll they'll, they'll shoplift Legos. They'll shoplift though the big boxes like the Millennium Falcon or something because those are like two hundred bucks a pop, yeah. right? So they'll steal one of those. And then they'll, 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 they'll walk, just, you know, just put it in a carriage, walk out of the store, try to walk out of the store. And then they'll take it to another Walmart somewhere else, you know, uh, you know, within driving distance and get the money. Oh, and wow. They do this, and they do this to different Walmarts. And you can get like $1,000 in a week. Oh, my God. Do this. Yes. And they make their girlfriends do it because, one, who's going to suspect you're actually shoplifting Legos? Even if they get caught, you yeah. know, if it's a woman, they'll say, oh, I was getting this for my kid and they didn't know I didn't have enough money. And, you know, they won't arrest her or anything because yeah. they're not going to guess that this is really all about heroin. Yeah. You know? So, yes, Lego scams. That's what I learned. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's real. I, I thought if I, if they were telling me this. I was in a group. I was doing. I was running a group, and they were telling me this, and I thought, that guy, "Are you serious?" And they laid it all out. They they told they 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 named the specific WalMarts they went to and the schedule. They had a schedule, like they had to keep it on the calendar, like which WalMarts they went to, what week. Yeah, like it was a whole thing that they were doing. But yeah, Lego scams. Because right, think about it. If you saw somebody with a box of Legos at Walmart or Target walk out of the store, you wouldn't think they're shoplifting. Who shoplifts Legos? Especially a, a big Millennium Falcon. Right, a big Millennium Falcon. Right, or one of the just one of the large sets. Who who does that? Yeah, that's, if it's if it's so ridiculous, like no one would accept that it's stealing. Right, and that's exactly what. And especially if it's a woman, you know, and she gives some sob story. Yeah. 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 Uh, I have a question here that someone also asked me to ask you. This is a, this is sure. a more this is a more funny story uh, or a question. I mean, um, so some someone said that they noticed that when you were running NF Geeks, um, whenever someone would upset you, you would blacklist them right away. <laughs> so, uh, ah, uh, no, I wouldn't. It wouldn't necessarily blacklist them, but and this is a generation gap thing. Yeah. I, I never really explained it then, but I yeah. can explain it now. And that is, as a Generation Xer. I have a different view as to what goes on or what should go on in Facebook as an old fart. I'll just admit it. The, the millennial generation grew up online, grew up in forums, grew up on social media. So they're okay with it being the law of the jungle because they grew up with it being the law of the jungle. And I didn't grow up with it like that. And I didn't like that. So I wanted, and I felt that my name was attached to it you know, my name personally. So I, I definitely did not allow the same kind of craziness that went on in, in other forums. And if I didn't, and, and I wasn't about to go through some process, it's a big internet. People can go anywhere they want. They can go to other forums and be nuts. You know, there's like a million MBTI forums. So if somebody who I felt was really out of line, um, I wasn't going to play games. I just, I just got rid of them. But it was about, a, it was about, a type of, of appropriateness that I wanted to have in the forum that I think is generational. That's what I mean, as I look back at now is that it's generational, 
because because other people who are because other like my sons for example my STJ son he never you know he was on NF Geeks he saw what was going on he was never bothered by anything that ever happened on NF Geeks because he's not bothered by anything that happens on any forum or whatever no matter how crazy it gets because he grew up with it you know he right, grew right. up in the 90s grew up in the 2000s you know so like it's you know for people to yell at each other and troll each other and 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 post inappropriate pictures. It's just normal. That's just what a forum's supposed to be. Yeah. You know, but I didn't, but I didn't want that. I wanted something sort of cleaner, you know, right. and maybe, and maybe kind of, um, granted, uh, old school. I, and, and, and if that's the accusation, that's not necessarily what they're saying, but I would say that's true. I think because I was a generation Xer and I had a different view of this, I wanted it to be more appropriate than what the average millennial was used to. Right. Right. All right. I mean, I, they just asked me to ask you that. So I'm like, yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. Well, that's fine. And honestly, um, you know, if I started the forum again, or I'll, 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 I'm going to be that way again, I don't make any apologies either. I, yeah. It's it's a big internet. And here's the thing too. And you should, everybody should remember this about all the forums. The person who runs the forum or the channel, it's yeah. their freedom of speech, not right. yours. You know, right. you know, this is your, so your YouTube channel, Kendrick, that's your freedom of speech. You can do whatever you want. You can get rid of any comment you want. You can delete anybody. That's yours. If people don't like it, they can start their own YouTube channel and put their face out there and have their own freedom of speech. Same thing's true about forums. Whoever created the forum, that's their forum. They can do whatever they want with it. You could create your own forum. And people did. People always created forums out of forums that I created to try to recreate what I created. That happened even with NF Geeks. And that happened with Crystal Star Castle, this other thing. There, there, there are actually other forums based on Crystal Star Castle of disgruntled Crystal Star Castle members who were mad at me and they wanted to have their own little NF little click thing going on. And so they did it. So, you know, those things happen. But you know what? You can do that. The internet allows to do that. I, I don't feel bad about it. I, I don't, you know, I don't want my name as, as somebody, you know, because I also always think about my teaching career, but I don't want my name associated with inappropriate things. I don't want my name associated with racism. I don't want my name associated with sexism. I don't want my name, my name is somebody associated with homophobia. I don't want my name associated with trolling. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to have it, you know, so uh, I make no apologies. But I was probably stricter than I think the, the population was used to because of the age gap. I think the age gap made me more, you know, back in my day, we had manners, you know, that, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. Right. And that would, that would be, and now that I'm even older, that'd probably be even more true. So I actually don't blame anybody. I mean, millennials grew up in the jungle of the internet and can handle themselves in it. You know, and they can, I'm sure you could, you know, you know, you've been on probably a bunch of forums and you've seen awful things and you know, you survived. Lots. <laughs> lots. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, he survived. My son survived. You know, he's, he was never off put by anything he's ever seen in a forum where I have. Yeah. Like, I look at the forums now. Like, I look, I'm in a lot of the Facebook forums. If you look, if you look, find my name, you'll see. Because I like to see what people are talking about. That's how I knew about Dave's superpowers and stuff. You know, I want to see what people are talking about in typology. I still love it. I'm just sort of lurking. And some of the things that go on in the forums, I'm appalled. And again, I'm sounding like an old fart, I admit. Okay, I'm almost 50. I can do that. <laughs> but I'm appalled. But I really am appalled. Like, so I was like, I can't believe they're posting this. And where are the admins? How could they just, what is wrong with these people? It's, and I'll be honest, it's always the NT forums. Those are the ones. The NF forums is not too bad. The NT forums are always like, oh, my God. How could they be posting this stuff? But here's the thing, and then why it's generational, and maybe also type two. None of them are bothered. You know, all these inappropriate, what I consider to be inappropriate posts have a ton of comments. Everyone seems to be having a good time, or at least the NTs are, you yeah. know, trolling them to each other back and forth. So, I mean, who am I to judge? Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But uh, I see it as generational, more than typological. Can, can I make an observation I just made about you? Uh, sure. It, it sounds like you have a masculine introverted sensing also, because like, okay. it's like, you know, introvert sensing is kind of like being the police. And... And it's your fourth function, so it comes out in a massive like, like police state, like you know, like hey, don't break the rules, you know. It's like, oh yeah, absolutely, you know, because see, I attribute it to growing up under SJ fascism. You know, I grew up under there's right and there's wrong. Yeah. There's a right, there's a right time for dinner and there's a wrong time for dinner. There's right. a right way to put on your shoes and there's a wrong everything. You know, I grew up with a, you know very rigid you know system you know, thinking, and yeah. there's a right way to be, you know, and there's a right way to talk to people. And there's a right way not to talk to people. You know, SJs right. are very much about orthodox communication, you know, you know, by, to this day, 
you know, women, there are women in their 90s who live around here who I won't call by their first name, you know, because they were my mother's friends. And my mother said, you never call these people by their first names ever for the rest of your life. You made that clear. Yes. So, you know, I'm, so I'm a 50 year old man calling a 90 year old woman, you know, Mrs. Anderson, you know, I won't dare use her first name, yes. you know, because of something that was said to me in 1974. You right, know, that, you know that far back. So yeah, I, I view it as as my SJ uh, upbringing to a certain degree. But yes, I would agree that's that's true. I do believe in you know my favorite superhero is Batman. You know, absolutely. Yeah. You know, for that same reason. Yeah. yeah. Also, I think he's an INTJ as as well. That's, that's I, I agree with you. I think he, Batman is definitely an INTJ. <laughs> yeah. So I love him. Yeah. yeah. Um. So we're gonna wrap up the uh, interview pretty soon. Uh, do, you right. have, do you have any questions for me specifically uh, that you would like to learn about? Oh, this, well, there's so much and now we're at the end. Well, first, once again, let me say thank you, Kendrick. I really appreciate that you took the time, uh, again, to invite me, to reach out to me, uh, to do this. This is, um, you know, I, I needed this to happen so that I could, you know, get NF Geeks kind of cranked up again. I needed to sort of, you know, get out there and do it. And so uh, again, I'm very grateful. Thank you for this opportunity. All right. My question, I guess, is um, where, where do you, as someone who's younger than me, not that you're young, you know, you're an adult, but you're younger than me. Where do you see typology going in the next five, 10, 15 years? What do you see as the future of typology as someone who's, you know, in it, in, in with, with vigor, with youth and vigor? Um, well, when I, when I was in college, I took a course in psychology and I, I vividly remember them showing a picture of a pie. And they said that this pie was your personality breakdown. So they said one third of your pie is your environment. Meaning, you know, if let's say you hang out with people who are fit, then chances are you're fit because they're influencing you to exercise and eat healthy, right? And vice versa. Um, so that's one third of the pie. The other one third of the pie is your relationship with your parents growing up. Um, and then the other one third of the pie is MBTI. That's kind of like what was presented when I was in college. So. I think in terms of where typology is going, I, I've just kind of been reading tons of books and you know watching lots of videos online in typology. And in my honest opinion, in terms of MBTI, I think the Dave superpower system is the superior system, uh, just mm -hmm. because he's finding a way to get, I think over eighty um, percent. He's doing a double blind test when it comes to typing someone, and he's I think he's getting over eighty percent success rate. Um, where two people who don't know each other, don't know each other's opinion, and you kind of go behind closed doors and you watch a video of somebody, um, you know, doing a spiel. And, you know, just based on that video that you watch, you, you can pick up things like, is this person self above pride? Is this person obsessed with their identity? Is this person obsessed with um, control? Is this person obsessed with chaos, you know? And, and just taking it, taking it piece by piece, kind of like very systematical, very, you know, NT, like you could say. Um, and uh, figuring out that, okay, this based on all these findings, based on how this person is behaving, and the things that this person is freaking out over, that this person is this type right here. And, and he has an exact breakdown. He, he even breaks down kind of like, he calls it animals. Basically, like, uh, I'll, I'll use ENFP as an example. So um, whenever our NE and our FI are being used together, he calls that consume because you're consuming information for yourself, right? And then... Your N, E, and T, when they interact together, he calls that play, where you're kind of expending energy, you know, expending energy or also sharing stories with the tribe or gathering information from somebody, but it's more of a sharing story. Now, when our T, E, and our S, I interact together, he calls that blast, where you're more teaching. It's not a two-way conversation. It's a one-way conversation where I'm teaching you something, I'm teaching you a concept, and I'm not here to you know, make it a joke or make it funny. It's just me teaching your concept. And then finally, he calls the last one sleep, which is an interaction between your FI and your SI. So those are your internal world. And that's kind of you preserving energy or processing your internal world. Um, and, he, and what he noticed was that there's 32 of each MBTI type. So there's 32 kinds of ENFP based on the combination of your animal stack and also a combination of your sexual modality. So... Um, based on what he found with that, so one ENFP can be extremely introverted because someone would sleep higher up on their, fun, uh, on their animal stack. Let's say they are consume and sleep, that's their first two animals, and then play third. That means they're so introverted as a result of having those two introverted animal first. So even though you're an ENFP and I'm an ENFP, we could be completely different people as a result of having um, those different combinations. 
and he also has the sexuality involved too. Like for example, for you, I don't know if you're, if, for me, it sounds to me that you're very auditory. I don't know if, if, that, if I'm right or not, but, um, but basically he said that your tribe function and that for us is TE and your sensory function for us, that's your SI, that makes up your sexual modality. So for example, the sensory function is your first letter and your tribe function is your se second letter. So you could be someone that's masculine, feminine. So SI could be masculine, tribe could be feminine. So MF, um, or you could be double feminine and someone that me might be double feminine. And they, they actually have Google Docs um, of every single person that they type. And they notice that every person that they type, if they have the same type, type kind of animals, same kind of um, sexual modalities, that they actually look the same. You know, like the ENFPs, they notice that a lot of ENFPs have an orange beard. You know, and, and, and it's, it's, it's kind of showing up in the data um, that this is what's happening. So for me, I think the Dave Superpower System in terms of MBTI, I think this is the upgrade. This is the next level um, when it comes to that. Um, and then for, when it comes to your relationship with your parents growing up, um, I, I read that the Enneagram is actually derived based on how your parents treated you when you were growing up. Yes, that's right. And um, so I feel like that one third of your pie is the Enneagram. And I think you can actually use Enneagram and objectively figure out how it works. So some of the theories that they've been trying to figure out as of late is that uh, with the Enneagram, it's actually the chemical balance in your brain with um, dopamine, uh, serotonin, and nor norepinephrine. Uh, okay. And depending on how much, like let's say you have high dopamine, high um, serotonin, and low and, and high uh, norepinephrine, I can't pronounce it pr properly, then you could be a type seven ENFP. So they, they have like the exact breakdown. And they also have the three brains theory where you know you have like the logical brain, the big one, the mammalian brain, and then the, the lizard brain, right? Um, and and the, the order that you use that is based on which Enneagram type you would be. So I think the Enneagram could be objectively type as well if, if someone took the time to apply the scientific method to it. I just don't think anyone has taken the time to do it, but Dave Superpowers is definitely applying the scientific method to MBTI and turning it to something, I, I, I call it an upgrade. So a lot of um, Dave Superpowers powers purists would get mad at me for saying this because they said, that's not MBTI, it's objective personality. Well, I think it's, it's, I think it's an upgrade of MBTI. I think it's MBTI 2.0 or 2, 3.0, um, but it's, they call it objective personality and I think that's the future, hands down. All right, what I, what I would say then, it is you know this goes back to the beginning of the interview is yes. so for, for you for all you guys who are into objective personality yeah. if you think it's the real deal that it's going to need actual scholarship research it's going to need actual um scholarship rigor it means people getting master's degrees and doctorates in social sciences people running actual out of universities real social science experiment and research and getting it actually published somewhere yeah if it's if it's the real deal if you really feel, this is what I would say, if you really feel it's the real deal, and I, and, and I think you do, you know, in light of the way you're talking about it. Yeah. And I'm not saying that you personally have to do this, but somebody has to start taking typology serious and not just be in their basement, you know, sort of like yeah. with their own little personality type microbrewery, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know mixing, yeah. the, mixing the beer in a, in a bucket. You know, yeah. it, uh, it, it needs, typology needs actual um, academic scholarship. So somebody has to take the ball. If this is real and this is better, then prove it. Somebody get a master's degree, get it in psychological testing or psychological research or social science research, start publishing. Create those research models and start publishing. And then, you know, you'll, you'll, it'll, it'll really come to light. It'll really sort of come to the surface. And hopefully that will land on somebody and they'll go and do it. It doesn't have to be you, but someone. Um, I, I think those people that sent me those questions actually want you to join the Objective Personality Facebook group, so to join the conversation because they think you. Oh, have... that's the, that's very nice of them. I, uh, I appreciate that. Well, I mean, that's why they like they they asked me to reach out to you because they think they, they actually value your input um, very highly, and they. Think... Oh, that's sweet. I so appreciate that. If if you were to join in the conversation, I think you could really um, bring a lot of input to the table, and um, so uh, you could check out the the Facebook groups and. You know, start joining the conversation. Um, right, I will. I'll, I'll check it out. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, you know, Mike, uh, Dr. Mike, you know, like, thank you for doing this. I really appreciated you doing this. I. Oh, you, me too. I th and again for the third time, Kendrick. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm really grateful that you reached out. 
yeah, like j- just for me personally, like talking to you, it's like I-, I feel like I'm talking to my future almost. You know, like oh, I hope not. <laughs> like, I mean, not 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 Forties were terrible, terrible. Yeah, but, but like you know, kind of like a potential path I could I could head towards. Because no, I know, I understand, I understand. Yeah. No, I, I know. Yeah, yeah, it, it's like an eye-opening experience to me. Like I'm sitting here listening to you talk, and I'm like, oh my god, this is this is real. This is this is what I can expect in the future. And uh, you know, like it, yeah, and so as for so for ENFP, ENFP, don't internalize any of that SJ crap. Yeah, yeah, it, it's don't. You'll not. It will not make you happy. You will not find happiness trying to shoot straight and fly right and work nine to five and and, and buy mulch at Home Depot. You're not. You're not going to. <laughs> you're not going to find happiness there. No ENFP can. Right. Don't internalize that SJ nonsense. Let the SJs do the SJ stuff. So. Um, Dr. Mike, before we wrap this up, how can people uh, talk to you, reach out to you? How can they get in touch with you? What oh, sure. Your- There's lots of ways. They can, um, so first of all, they can find me on Facebook. Um, they can find me, uh, you know, get, they can reach me on Facebook. They can reach me. Um, the NF Geeks YouTube channel still exists. Uh, you can reach me there. And you can also email me at nfgeeks at gmail.com. I check that email all the time. Uh, you can you can reach me at any of those places. Uh, there might be a new NF Geeks likes page coming up, so uh, you know you'll look for that. But uh, they can just Facebook or NF Geeks at Gmail, Got or the, or the channel. Go to the channel. Channel's still active. If you leave a comment, I might reply. You never know. I will uh, leave those information in the description of this video once I have it uploaded, so people can Great. reach out to you. Great. Uh, all right, Dr. Mike, thank you for doing this again. And uh, Oh, thank you. This was a lot of, this is a blast, Kendrick. We'll, yeah. we, should, we should do this again. We'll, we'll, we should do this another time. In your, this was channel, fun. In your channel. This, you this bet. Time. Yeah, you bet, man. All right, man. I'm going to stop the recording now and I'll say goodbye to everyone and uh, we'll wrap this up. Thanks again. All right. Thank you.